Ray Charles died on June 10th. He was 73 years old. For seven decades, he entertained audiences with a unique blend of jazz, pop, R&B, gospel, country, rock, and soul. Here is a look at Ray Charles performing. Mama, don't you treat me wrong. Come and love me, daddy, all night long. Ray Charles lost his vision as a young child in Florida. He then enrolled in a school for the blind and deaf where he learned how to read music using Braille. At 15, he left school for the farthest city from Tampa. He headed to Seattle to develop his sound. 12 Grammys and countless hits later, he leaves us with an immense body of work that continues to influence some musicians of all styles. Frank Sinatra once called him the only genius in our business. He has one record left. Genius Loves Company, an album of duets with everyone from Elton John to Gladys Knight. It will be released later this summer. Joining me now for a conversation about the life and music of Ray Charles is record producer Phil Ramone, who did the new album, pianist Marcus Roberts, journalist Christopher John Farley, and senior editor of Time Magazine, and Anthony D. Curtis, contributing editor for Rolling Stone. He wrote the upcoming cover story on Ray Charles. I am pleased to have each of them here. Uh, I'll just go around. Phil, tell me, what was this man's genius that Sinatra and everybody else has said was so uniquely him? Well, I think, uh, most of all, the ultimate musician for all of us to see him. I saw him when I was very young, and uh, he made the album, which became the genius of Ray Charles, right. and watched him call out the, the wrong notes and stuff in the orchestra. And Quincy Jones was in the production room with Ahmed Erdogan. It was a, a, an amazing moment for him because he understood the orchestra, he understood orchestration. And Quincy always said, you know, that's where I learned how to write for the big orchestra. He, um, he also was the ultimate musician with other players. The respect and the fear sometimes came out. Fear? Fear because he could hear everything. Yeah. And I think he was the king of tempo he would find something in a song that would become his. As uh, I think one of his favorite people was Count Basie, who could take a song and find the right tempo. Uh, Ray absolutely could do it. And when we got involved in this album, uh, which unfortunately is the last of the Ray Charles album, but it, I watched everybody we worked with yeah. get inspired. And, and when I say fear, it's probably high highest respect you can give anybody yeah. is when you care about somebody and when he says something you know darling you could do this a little better you better listen yeah everybody wanted to do it everybody there's you know, still it, there's still a line yeah to record you bet yeah now all of these influences that appeared in his music throughout his life started early as i you know, i got some of this from the piece nice piece you wrote in time it is started early from this at, at when his mother had found that piano and and he would listen to everything from classical to gospel certainly and and all of that sort of he blended in and and created what became his sound and 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 his his way of playing a piano right well, well certainly the biggest thing that we have to keep in mind about what Ray represents is that he connects us through his sound to how things ought to be, how things have been, and ultimately it's always an optimistic point. And even though he may be dealing with very ironic issues, okay, even tragic issues, but there's always a sound. When you hear Ray Charles, you feel better after you hear him. <laughs> what do you have in your hand? This? Yeah. It's a, it's a, uh, it's called a Braille light. Yeah. Um, Stevie wanted to send it to me. Uh, I, I had an older version. He said, man, you got to get hip and get the new version. So he <laughs> sent it to me. But it, it's, it's a great, uh, vehicle of communication. And again, Ray, a lot of people don't know, he was very interested in technology. And right before his death, he had actually been working, uh, for several months, uh, learning a very, very comprehensive, complicated, ornate uh, music program uh, 
that allowed us to use Sibelius to, to compose scores. Wow. And he was very fascinated with that because even though I'm, I'm sure he didn't mind yelling out clarinet should have played a B flat instead of a B natural, but this program actually allows you to control the input of the data into the program so that when it gets to the arrangers, it's already at least 95% where you want it to be. And he, and he, you know, he was very excited about that and, and, and sort of what that would uh, provide us in the future as far as blind musicians yeah. and composers. You know, he, also, oh, sorry, he, he also could mix, yeah. which is you know, something that a lot of musicians don't get to do when they're in the studio, but he absolutely demanded that he could do that. And I remember the first time we ever recorded uh, and we were experimenting with digital and analog, yeah. and of course the machine unfortunately failed but he took the analog and he said it'll be old the old way but he took his and Billy Joel's voice and blended it I could not imagine anybody doing it better and the feel <laughs> of the orchestra he, he loved technology yeah. uh, you wrote about him in a, in a loving piece here uh, in the issue of Time magazine uh, the genius of brother Ray he helped create soul and in a lifetime of performing never lost his own where did it come from well, I think it had its roots in the church. You know, when he was growing up in Florida, um, his mother used to take him to New Shiloh Baptist Church, right. and I think a lot of what he saw there, you know, later flowed into his own uh, recordings. It came when he was out on tour, when he was, you know, finding himself as a musician after the age of 15, you know, knocking around Seattle, knocking around New Orleans. Um, a lot of the sounds he heard there found their way into his performance, his style, his attitude, and a, a, lot, of, a lot of it was uh, obviously self-generated. I mean, a lot of it, he, he helped create soul, and he wasn't the first guy to perform soul music, uh, but he was one of the guys that helped create the genre and, uh, and played it like nobody else you know, uh, ever has and ever did. And I think one thing also to point out about him that make, really make, makes him unique is he was someone who was involved in a, a lot of aspects of record making. I mean, you talk about him mixing. Well, he also was someone who made sure when he signed his deal after Atlantic that he got control of his own masters. Yeah. And that was a unique thing. A lot of artists don't have that. And so it made him a man not only ahead of his own time, but ahead of our time today, because most artists today don't have control of their own masters, and they wish to heck that they did. And Ray Charles was the guy who made sure he was on top of that. When you... Tell me what you liked about him. Well, I mean, it's a little bit of a point that that's been touched on here but you know he was just one of those guys that the second he opened his mouth you, you knew exactly where you were and there was a you know a kind of authority to it that was um, very compelling you know there was a sense uh, I think for all of his skill like he always talked about he responded to a lyric he wanted to tell a story mm -hmm. and he said you know there are you know songs because obviously a song like what I say which was you know certainly the record that in many ways ma really made his reputation uh, he said, well, that was a nonsense lyric. He goes, but when you, you know, when you listen to a lyric like, I can't stop loving you, he goes, how many people have said that? He goes, yeah. you know, because I, I listened for something that I could, I could put across to somebody and speak to them about something that I felt and something that they felt in their own lives. And I certainly felt that every time I heard Ray Charles. I mean, there was a, a real sense that you were listening to an individual voice. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't a bad singer The either. response thing came from the gospel, didn't it? I mean, from singing in, in, in churches? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, he, in the same way that he kind of eroticized and, and secularized gospel music, um, you know, he kind of eroticized that call and, call and response. I mean, Ray Charles and the Red Lads, I mean, yeah. that's what everybody got so what worked up about <laughs> with what I say, you know, man. It wasn't, uh, yeah. well, maybe you didn't know what they said, but you definitely knew what they were talking about. Yeah. Well, I mean, the amazing thing to me, too, is that I, mean, I remember it was, it was, it was what, 62 that he came out with Country and Western Sounds? Mm -hmm. Modern Sounds and Modern Country Sounds and Western, Western yeah. Music, yeah. 62. Yeah. yeah. There was always this capacity to shift, to try new things. Mm -hmm. right? well, well, yeah, that's what I think when people say that he's the genius of soul, the father of soul. In a way, even though those titles, you know, are big titles, it almost sells him short because he wasn't just about soul music, though that would have been, you know, plenty more than enough. Um, he also was a guy that was interested in, 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 in country and Western music, and he explored that. Standards, you know, the blues. He really had a far-ranging um, imagination in terms of what he wanted to attach his voice to, attach his talent to. And a lot of that went all the way back to Greenville, Florida, 
when you know um, a, a neighbor had that piano, mm -hmm. had that um, uh, that jukebox, and had all sorts of things on that jukebox, and Ray Charles would listen to it all when he was a kid, and it kept coming out as he, when he was an adult, as he grew into yeah. a mature he performer. He left home at 15. 15, he hit yeah. the road. 15, yeah. he hit the road. 15, That's he hit amazing. the road. He went to school, I think, when he was seven. I mean, he went yeah. away. To you know, go to the school for the blind. Yeah, exactly. School for the blind. Was it right. Florida School yeah. for the blind? Yes, it's, a, it's, it's the same school I went to. He, you went to the really? same school? Yes, sir, yeah. Same one. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it really actually was a, a, a good place to get good rudimentary musical training because they made you learn Braille music. Yeah. I, I used to tear mine up at first. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I wasn't probably as, as um, you know, into it as he was originally, but, you know, your basic formative years there are good. And, and then at the point, I think, where he left, he had obviously decided, right, he had made some conscious decision that he was going to follow the American dream and that he was going to redefine and rearticulate his position in the world. And music was the way he was going to do it. And I think from learning chess and all these things, it's, it's all about reducing the barriers that seemingly would be in a blind person's life. Reducing the barriers. Yeah, reducing the barriers, redefining his democratic right and his ability to impose freedom and all of these sensibilities that everyone deep down relates to in his singing. I mean, people relate to, again, this optimism, this hope, this sense of I can control it, and, and we all are mm. in some way related, and we all in some way have a universal struggle that we understand, but we're going to win. And that's what, to me, that's what I hear. The, the, you, you had a thing about his mother. His mother said to him, you know, they're all, yes, you're blind, but there are always two, th two ways to do everything, and you just have to find the other way. And I think that's what drew people into his music, because in, in his life, there's, there was always that two-stage thing. One, there was the obstacle, and then there was the way around it. And that's where the optimism comes in, because a lot of his lyrics, a lot of the songs that he chose to perform, were really kind of despairing songs. You think of a song like Busted. Right. I mean, that's a song where you're broke, you're down and out, and yeah. you're having a bad time of it. Even a song like Georgia on My Mind, I mean, you're longing for it to return to either a woman or a state, and you're not having such a good time of it either. But the way Ray Charles performed those songs, you, you felt good about it by the time they were done. You're like, geez, I'm, I'm happy to be busted. I'm happy yeah. I'm not in Georgia, though yeah. I wish I could get back there. Here's the other thing. It, 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 when you think of Ray Charles, I don't think, I don't know. Someone said to me, if someone would say to me today, you know, who's, who's the next Ray Charles? You can't imagine no. anybody, can you? No. Well, I don't think, it's, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't know how many artists ever get the chance to have the, the cataclysmic kind of impact that he had and the enduring kind of impact that he had. But there's certainly... You know, I think as I think everyone's noted here, you know, a series of generations of artists, you know, yeah. were influenced by him, you know, from Alicia Keys and Nora Jones exactly. on back. Some of these know? are on this. Of the things that he did, Marcus, what would you most like to be able to do? I mean, you know, you've gotten rave reviews across the spectrum, and you and I have had many conversations at the piano on this and other programs. Right? Anything he did that, that you say, God, that's the one thing I'd like to be able to duplicate that Charles did? Uh, it would it would simply be to continually become more able to communicate a profound vision of art through a language that is easily understood, easily interpretable. Yeah. Something that a person could listen to it, and they don't need to pull out a dictionary to get what you know the point you made. Yeah, right, uh, right, right, and, right. I know and, exactly. and I think he was just a, a, a master at that in several genres which is really very difficult uh, very few people do it very people uh, have done it and another thing you know that you would want to be able to, to to hopefully do is see the influence of your career around you be able to see it have it in some tangible uh format uh, that uh, you know with other musicians other you know like you know phil speaks about working with him and just you know when you're around someone like that you know, and even though I never knew him, but again, even without knowing him, he still, there's a clear sense of why he's a hero. Because yeah. he really did shatter barriers. He really did uh, command yeah. respect through the obstacles that he was able to not only conquer, but again, redefinition. That's the reason it's very difficult to replace him in the same way that, well, all of us who play piano, well, if you use your thumb, that's because of Bach. And even if you never heard his music, that's because of Bach. So it's, uh, mm. That's well said. I think that's true about genius, period. It is the idea to take complex ideas 
uh, and express them in a way that, tra that, that crosses over uh, so that people can, can, can that, so that it, people can access it and accept it and it resonates with them. I mean, people that do that have the highest skill to be able to define uh, some inspiration and put it in a language or a color or a form, you know, that reaches across the chasm, the chasm that separates, you know, artists from. Well, it was a point that Ray sure. Charles himself made at one point where, he, you know, when he talked about uh, soul music, taking these gospel songs and secularizing them, he said, you know, everybody was so upset. He goes, a couple of years later, they called it soul music, and everybody was doing it. And there's <laughs> yeah. that sense that, like, when you have a great idea, you know, at first, you know, everyone's scandalized, and then it just becomes part of the climate yeah, of, exactly. of what everything yeah, is. Yeah. Well, well, if you don't make somebody mad, you, you, you yeah, probably not get much done. Yeah. I mean, Mahalia Jackson was attacked by the, by the Baptist Church because she sang at the Newport Jazz Festival in, in, in 58 with Ellington. So it, it, this is a natural part of the artistic process. Yeah. You know? If you're not making somebody mad, then you're okay. not taking enough chances probably not. or risk or not. Right. Uh, he stopped writing songs at some point. Yeah. I don't know why. Uh, I I think uh, more than anything is he became the ultimate interpreter yeah. of songs. I mean, that you talk yeah, about exactly. gospel songs, but how about America the Beautiful? All right, yeah. Things oh, exactly. like that, and you go, oh. Oh, yeah, there, exactly. He does a duet with Willie Nelson on this, and one with uh, Elton John, and they're both songs. I remember asking him what song he would like to do with Elton John, for instance, and he said, sorry seems to be the hardest word. Well, I heard him perform it six months before. I mean, the audience was <laughs> wrinkled from, oh, from the tears. He, he, yeah. he, I think he felt comfort with that. I think it's a shame that he didn't write other songs, but maybe he felt a better path because he was the signal. The ultimate interpreter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, go ahead, Mark. When, 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 well, when you're on that level of being able to interpret, it's almost like you're writing songs anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when you, yeah. when you, because the, the idea of personalizing something, which is the biggest gift of any artist, really, in any genre, uh, he just had that gift to the point where, I guess, honestly, he really realized, well, I don't really have to do that. <laughs> it's already in the culture. I'll take all the folk music, yeah. the country music. I can add something to something that's already been there and make it new, right? He never yeah. seemed especially, oh, I'm sorry, he never seemed especially pained by it. You know, by, oh, gee, I'm not writing. I mean, he just, I think, made a decision at some point, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, there was enough things out there that were kind of gripping him, you know? Yeah, I, I think also during his Atlantic years, um, one reason he decided to write some songs then is because he felt like the material he was getting in wasn't something he wanted to cover, so he might as well sort of self-generate his own stuff. And some of his best songs, you know, came out almost by accident. What I'd say was actually the result of, of, of an improv. He had run out of material for that night, and so he just told his band, hey, let's just sort of wing it, do what I do. And of course, now everybody does what he, yeah, what he, right, do, he did right, back right. then. It, it worked out pretty well. So he, he didn't always have to sort of create his own stuff. Um, I think he was able to sort of take other people's stuff and make it their own. I think interpreters don't always get enough credit for what they do. It's something that Cassandra Wilson, the great jazz vocalist, has sort mm -hmm. of complained about before. And obviously Billie Holiday yeah. didn't write a lot of her own songs either, and, uh, and she certainly made them her she, own. Yes, yeah, she did. It's the uh, post-Bob Dylan problem, you know, like yeah. the, the, the assumption that everybody's got to write all their own or, songs or, or, all or, the time. Exactly. Yeah. Or James Taylor yeah. did the same thing. I don't want to put me in a they're different artist, but same idea. I mean, the, the, um, the notion of the drugs... Uh, or the idea of the drugs. What did that... How long did he have a problem? Did uh, it, for it, a while. Most of his life, or was no, it something no, that he... No, no, It seemed something that was kind of confined. He started when he was a teenager, yeah. and I guess, you know, let's see, he was probably about 25 or so when he kicked. You know, he'd gotten arrested, and it was a, it was a very public thing. Uh, and I think he felt, you know, I, you know, now we're so used to people coming yeah. on shows and talking a lot about it. Yeah, I think he decided... You know, this is this is just creating more problems for me than it's worth. And he just stopped. <laughs> Drugs aren't that good. Yeah, and he, you know, it's not that important. He never was particularly moralistic about it one way or the other. You know, he obviously thought it wasn't a good idea. He stopped. He never particularly liked discussing it. Um, and, you know, I think that was that. You know, it, there wasn't a lot of drama surrounding it yeah. in, in his case. Did, did you ever try to reach him, Marcus? Did you ever try, reach out to him to say, gee, I'm Marcus Roberts and we're in the same business and... 
Well, I'm blind. Ray I'm Charles black. would, would he would went to the same school. He would not have had any reason to take my call whatsoever. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't the, think that. I, yeah, I, I, the, I well, don't believe that. Well, no, I mean, only well, no, no, uh, only in the sense that when you have a life that really is, or, or was as 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 rich with, you know, opportunity and success and, you know, complexity. And Ray was somebody who just wasn't. You didn't. I, how many people do you know that would just be picking up the phone calling them? I mean, you know, no, I know. some people you don't you, you find it. I mean, one time I did, you know, I called Stevie and I said, uh, and 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 I did propose to him that it'd be great if, if the, you know, if we all three could do a record. What a great could, idea. You know, you know, could you talk to him? And Stevie said, well, let's hear it, Marcus. Stevie you know, said, in your own inimitable way. Yeah, he just said, well, Ray is, you, you know, he he he's pretty much he pretty much it would be if he did it. We would actually probably be agreeing to do Ray's record, <laughs> and, well, and 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 I mean it. You know, it makes sense because because of who he is. I mean, he's got such a wealth of things that he can do, that he did do. Uh, I think had I run into him, and you know what I mean, and there was some natural. It, it just never happened. I, I, I uh, wish you'd run into Mr. Ramon. He would have done that in a <laughs> nanosecond, wouldn't you? <laughs> in a second. <laughs> and, uh, you couldn't have gotten on the phone fast enough no. for that I, idea. But I have yeah. to say, you know, I certainly. Um, you know his voice though is 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 so original and confident somehow that you you know you feel like you kind of knew him so even though i didn't know him but just you know reading about him and yeah. uh, you know the connection as far as being to the same school and some of the people when i first went there you know remembered him being there right. they, were, they, they did there were still people at florida school for the right yeah there were there were there were a couple yeah. not not many because you know but you know people did you know remember and of course no one had any idea that he was going to leave there and do you know what he did uh, but I think, and the other thing, you know, Ray, I mean, he played saxophone. I mean, he was, yeah. he was just somebody who had such a boundless amount of confidence in his ability to get things done. If he wanted to get it done, he wasn't going to stop until it was done. And I think that's mm -hmm. the power of, if we want to use the word soul, okay, or in jazz music, we say playing the blues. Uh, whatever that timeless thing in great art is, because uh, it's in everything. So if you put on a late Beethoven string quartet, or you know you put on even Beethoven's fifth, and everybody hears it, da 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 da. I mean, come on, it's just you know E flat to C, really. I mean, what is it? But there is something in great yeah. themes and how they're developed that we all love, and that's what we're all reaching yeah. for. And when you work on records, I mean, that's you you're looking for that. One phrase that just makes a whole song perfect. Yeah. Let me, let me raise rock and roll. This is what he said in his autobiography. I never considered myself part of rock and roll. My stuff was more adult. It, had, it was more difficult for teenagers to relate to. My stuff was filled with more despair than anything you'd associate with rock and roll. Since I couldn't see people dancing, I didn't write jitterbugs or twists. I wrote rhythms that move me. My style requires pure heart singing. But there was rock and roll. Absolutely. I mean, if, if rock and roll musicians were to give credit to anybody, I mean, Ray's got to be at the top of your list. Yeah. Because, again, as I, as I said earlier, his interpretation of rhythm and how he felt where the groove is, is probably the most, not only soulful, but the most danceable thing there is. Yeah. He could do a, a, a ballad and tear you up with it because you could cry to it at the same time you could move to it. He never... He was the most emotional contact between voice. I think, you know, people talk about Sinatra, and I've, I'm very fortunate having heard them both come through the speaker system in the right. control room. And even to this minute today, I, I happen to want to listen to something of Ray's. Now, is that what, I mean, to speak to that, I mean, you having worked with both of them, I mean, what is it that, that those two geniuses, share what is it that is beyond what marcus has already said beside the instant recognition yeah the voice absolutely it just it just grabs. captivates you yeah. and and the reality of of the first note to the you know i i'd say if i ever had a 10 second test and i was only to survive <laughs> i could identify those two but so could millions of other people because he ray particularly had another way in which the words would come out and it would sometimes take time. It would almost sound like he was stammering. But he'd let you wait for that word to come at you. And none of it was planned. 
it's just all part of him. Is that and the I, jazz influence? Or? Oh, I think so. I think that, that that goes all the way back to where the Billie Holidays and everybody got their influence. But it's reality, though. And, and the same for Sinatra. There's no question. That, yeah. uh, well, go ahead. Ray Charles once said that he, he thought the definition of soul was when someone listens to your voice and thinks you've been through the experience you're singing about. Absolutely. And I think that's one reason why he was such a great singer, because when you hear him sing his songs, you feel like, you know, he did go through those things, and sometimes he did, and you feel like you're going through those things along with him sometimes. And I think that it takes a great singer to get that across, and he had it in, in a way, you know, Frank Sinatra had that too, um, and only the great singers are able to take you to that place along with their lyrics. He said that he saw songs as scripts and that like a song was a kind of performance like a film or a theater piece and that you had to inhabit that character and um, you know he obviously did that you know as effectively as you possibly can when did you start writing this? <laughs> 90, look uh, at this, this that is we heard that he died. farewell to the genius a tribute to Ray Charles James Brown, Billy Joel, James Taylor, Bonnie Ray, Jerry Wexler and more a retrospective his life and music you, you, you got the news that he he died, and uh, you know, just kind of put together a you know a biographical piece, you know, talking about uh, you know providing a frame for those reminiscences that you know we chased down from. Uh, well, this you know, was people he, who, uh, this was like last this Thursday night. Thursday yeah, night. Yeah, I remember talking to the editor, the music editor there, Joe Levy, and I said, uh, well. Joe, I mean, so Monday is out of the question. <laughs> he said, Anthony, Saturday's out of the question. <laughs> so it was like Friday morning. And, but, you know, somebody, Ray, you know, somebody like, yeah, know, somebody like Ray, Ray Charles is somebody you're walking around thinking about all the time. You know, I mean, his music is just part of the atmosphere, you know, for anybody who, you know, certainly, I mean, I'm, I'm 52. I grew up with it. And uh, so, you know, you just kind of sit down, you clear out your head, and you, you, and you what? do it. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, he died at 73, liver failure. Yeah. He, he never stopped touring, did he? No. I mean, he was touring constantly. I mean, I've seen him everywhere. I've seen him in Colorado. I've seen him in North Carolina. I've seen him in California. I think, he, you know, he was very old school in that way. I think he saw it, you know, I mean, I think artists now, you know, they make one big album and, you know, they go on the road every five years or something, yeah. whereas I think he saw himself as, you know, and a guy, the, like you, you sing songs and then you take them out and you perform them for people. Yeah. I think he liked it and he saw that as, that was what his or work like was. like the road and like the audience and like the whole thing. Yeah, and he had a commitment to the audience when he was there because one thing he didn't like doing is he didn't didn't like doing the encore because he felt like the, the, the main performance was the performance, yeah. he was going to give it 100%. And when he, he'd finish it with usually what I'd say, and that was it, and if that was enough for you, then maybe maybe you saw the wrong person. And so the encore is not a thing he really believed in because he was going to give 100%, and that's the way he kind of lived his life. Thank you all. The, uh, I, I take such pleasure in having you here um, to honor this great, great American. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Ray Charles, dead at age 73, leaves us. His music leaves us an album we have not yet heard. Duets leaves us a, a music that is being a movie that is being made about his life, starring Jamie Foxx. Um, great American. We'll be back. Stay with us. Still in uh, Pittsburgh dreams I see when I know the road. Had a road leads back to you. When I'm I know Georgia No, 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 no Peace I find It's this old sweet song Keep Georgia on my Oh, no.